Professor Simon Shaw Miller is Chair of History of Art at the University of Bristol and former Professor of History of Art and Music at Birkbeck College, University of London, an Honorary Associate and Research Fellow of the Royal Academy of Music. Professor Shaw Miller's contribution to the art of music included The Art of Music, A Complex Art. Today he joins us to present a question and a few remarks on art, music, bicycles, Kandinsky, and Duchamp. Please welcome Dr. Shaw Miller. To start with, um, a question. Why are there several arts and not just one? I'm not, of course, the first person to ask this question. The French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy posed it most effectively in, the, in this form in his book, The Muses, in 1994. But it is a question that is perhaps surprisingly rarely asked. The more we consider it, the more complex it becomes. It's a question that hovers below the surface of much of my thinking. On the one hand, the answer is obvious. There just are several arts, music, poetry, visual arts, sculpture, theater, etc. But consider things more deeply, and the edges of these certainties and the boundaries of these practices are not so clearly identified. Where does performance art fit? Where is video art, collage, opera, or kinetic art? Nancy was interested in using this question as a way of posing an inquiry into the essence of art, into its pluralism. Is there such a thing, he asked, as art, capital A? I'm more interested in the historical dimension. How do ontological features come to adhere to specific cultural forms? What are the features and points of emphasis? What are the shifts and modulations that occur given that art is not a timeless category, but a concept that evolves and changes as the societies and individuals who make it evolve and change? In the ebb and flow of artistic evolution, and in using the term evolution, I don't mean progress, I just mean change, the borders of art forms are susceptible, to use pejorative terms, to infection and contamination, or less pejoratively, expansion and amplification from their sister and brother arts. But how do we think across these borders? How do we identify borders in the first place? How does difference signify? What role does the academy play? I'm thinking here of professional structures, university departments, for example. My original question is thus multiplied or perhaps atomized. But here I'm more concerned to pose such questions because in doing so, we can find interesting sites and positions from where we can hear art and see music, the two forms I'm principally drawn to. Chronologically, the moment I focus on is around the fuzzy um, edges of the um, area we call modernism, a period I would push between the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. Within this periodization, there is one artist who's frequently evoked in discussions of art and music, the Russian painter Vasily Kandinsky. Both he and his critics analogically allied the development of an abstract paintedly form of expression to music as a parallel form of abstract expression. But there's an exactly contemporary artist who, while key to understanding the ontological vicissitudes of modern and postmodern culture more generally is rarely addressed in relation to this key moment of modernism where music comes to the fore as a new paradigm of expression. That artist is, of course, the Frenchman Marcel Duchamp. In what follows, I'd like to briefly explore the role of music as a key paradigm for understanding modernist artistic culture, and in so doing, position both these artists as central to its full polyphonic assessment. The image I've chosen is not random. In 1913, Kandinsky painted Composition 7, a large oil on canvas, one of his biggest artistic statements, built up from many preliminary drawings and watercolors, over 30 in total. From this process, Kandinsky evolved an abstract visual language developed from biblical themes of apocalypse, deluge, and the last judgment. Those are the subjects, effectively, on which this painting was based. 
In his 1918 autobiographical statement, he wrote, Painting is a thundering conflict of different worlds, which in and out of battle with one another are intended to create the new world, which is called the world of art. Each work arises technically in a way similar to that in which the cosmos, cosmos arose, through catastrophes, from which the chaotic roarings of the instruments finally create a symphony, the music of the spheres, the creation of the work as the creation of worlds. The painting is thus a symphony, a grand, large-scale, polyphonic statement, a world in itself. Kandinsky's project is to move painting away from objective reality, from objects, and towards an independent spiritual existence. The title of the work is significant and obviously has musical intent. He wrote in the same text, Quote, the word composition moved me spiritually. During this period, he came to desire spirituality as the opposite of the material world. He was driven by the desire to, in his own words, dissolve objects, an ability um, to develop an ability to overlook the object within my painting. He came to this realization following a powerful aesthetic encounter with one of his own paintings in the dusk, standing on its side against the wall. He found the work profoundly beautiful, but failed to recognize it, seeing in it, quote, nothing but forms and colors. And in seeing it thus, he wrote, I knew for certain that the object harmed my painting. But the move to abstraction was far from straightforward, for he's immediately presented with a problem. I quote, a frightening depth of questions weighed with responsibility confronted me. And the most important, what is to replace the missing object? The way past this object was in large part to be found via the model of music, the least object bound of the arts in his view. Again, he wrote in 1912, a painter who finds no satisfaction in mere representation, however artistic, in his longing to express his inner life, cannot but envy the ease with which music, the most non-material of the arts today, achieves this end. He naturally seeks to apply the methods of music to his own art. Duchamp was also confronted with fundamental artistic problems and questions at exactly the same time in 1913. But unlike his Russian colleague, he was always sympathetic to cross-art blurrings, to what he later called the infra-thin, that is the first step on the space between the difference of one thing and something else. The strongest of which for him was possibly the age-old relationship between art and literature. In forging an artistic identity for himself, he sought the opposite of Kandinsky's concern with intuitive, organic, subjective feeling. He instead promoted the conscious mind and the conceptual. He said in a later interview, in France, there is an old saying, stupid like a painter. The painter was considered stupid but the poet and writer very intelligent. I wanted to be intelligent. I had to have the idea of inventing. It's nothing to do what your father did. It's nothing to be another Cezanne. In my visual period, there is a little of the stupidity of the painter. All my work before the nude was visual painting. Then I came to the idea. I thought the eidetic formation a way to get away from influence. Painting had reached a crisis point for him too then, but rather than dissolving the object in a symphony of colors and abstract forms as Kandinsky proposed, he instead dissolved the idea of painting, replacing it with the very objects Kandinsky found so problematic. In Duchamp's case, the object was not even one fashioned by the hand of the artist, but rather it was merely chosen. Rather than seek abstraction, Duchamp sought the ready-made, and the vehicle that propelled this fundamental shift in his aesthetic was the bicycle. This is his first ready-made. The Belgian art theorist uh, Thierry, Thierry de Deurve has, against the current of much thinking, linked the advent of the ready-made intimately to the history of painting. He sees, rightly I think, 
Duchamp's abandonment of the la uh, latter an invention, or perhaps discovery of the former, as events in the narrative of painting. For those less familiar with the idea, we might define the ready-made as, to paraphrase Duchamp himself, an object chosen by an artist and offered a new thought. An object moved from the world into the realm of art. In relation to the birth of the ready-made and its relation to painting, uh, Dedeuve says this, every five years or so, painting alternatively agonizes and rises from its ashes. This swing of the pendulum is a symptom. Not only does it indicate that some hidden solidarity must exist between these two trends that apparently negate each other, it also calls for the re-examination of the art historical context in which the ready-made appeared as an offspring of Duchamp's abandonment of painting. The birth of abstract painting is the relevant context, and as such, it is theoretical and aesthetic as well as art historical. It revolves around the issue of specificity or purity attached to the word painting. The idea of purity and media specificity inherent in Dedeuve's words are linked to the model of music mentioned above. Here, music functions as a model of artistic and aesthetic autonomy, where form and content, or code and referent, adhere intimately or are coincidental. All art should constantly quest to attain this condition of music, so claimed the English critic Walter Pater in the approaching dawn of the 20th century. What links the ready-made and painting at this crucial juncture of modernism is, I would claim, the idea of music. In pulling art into the field of radical abstraction and in order to develop a meaningful context for non-figurative art, music came to the rescue as a paradigm, an example that could help glue concepts of abstraction to meaning. But music is not a simple or, I would suggest, a singular concept, nor did it signify for Duchamp in the same way as it did for Kandinsky and other modernist painters. Ideas of music are polyphonic, and we need to understand this difference if we are to more fully understand how music could act as a model for such seemingly opposed artists as Duchamp and Kandinsky. Music is conceivable within two broadly opposing ontological identities. One sees it as a purist art, as the most abstract of the arts, a form of expression stripped to an essence, to sound alone, a formal paradigm for abstract painting, what has been called absolute music. The other approach might view music as a discourse in Foucault's terms, um, constituted as a site of social practice. Here, Music is not a stable, essential sonic entity, but a process that changes as it's performed through cultures and societies. Music understood in this expanded sense can be a model of the connective and contextual of performative synthesis. Music is not just sound, or maybe we should say, a la John Cage, not even sound. But as a social and cultural practice, its bodies and spaces, ideologies and perceptions, customs and objects. This embodied object-encased music was recognized by Duchamp and has consequences, I'd suggest, for our understanding of the birth of the ready-made. But both models of purity on the one hand and discourse on the other are, of course, to be recognized as ambitions and trajectories, not as achievements and ends. The former aspiration to strip art down to its essentials, to concentrate on media specificity, is seen clearly in early abstract painting, as I've suggested. For when the abstract, early abstract painters spoke of painting, they understood its specificity to mean that which defines painting qua painting, transhistorically and universally, some essence that they supposed to be common to all painting. They prescribed the painter's task as to make this essence visible. In the early stages of modernism, this essence was, somewhat ironically, sought in material, in media specificity, in the fundamental phenomenological makeup of painting, in paint, color, and the support on which it was spread. When Kandinsky moved away from objects in painting, he approached the object of painting. The art that already seemed to be made of essential stuff was music, where form and content were integrated. Music had the power to speak to our inner lives without the need for translation, it was argued. How might 
painting aspire to this condition. Through direct contact with material and form, as Paul Gauguin said, color, which like music is a matter of vibrations, reaches what is most general and therefore most identifiable in nature, its inner power. The role of subjectivity is important here and constitutes a direct appeal to an inner reality, a constituent of mod modernity's insularity. Such an approach finds full realization in the aesthetics of Kandinsky. He wrote in 1911, the arts as such have never in recent times been closer to one another than in this latest period of spiritual transformation. In all that we've discovered above lie hidden the seeds of the struggle towards the non-naturalistic, the abstract, towards inner nature. Consciously or unconsciously, artists turn gradually towards an emphasis on their materials, and from this effect there arises of its own accord the natural consequence, the comparison of one's own elements with those of other arts. In this case, the richest lessons are to be learned from music. Painting's quest, then, is to seek out the particularity of its material and strive for direct expression. Kandinsky believed this was a matter of allowing the materials to speak as much as possible for themselves. But paint and colour meant something rather different to Duchamp. He, uh, as did the idea of speaking for itself. As I've said, at exactly the same time as Kandinsky was formulating his abstract aesthetic, Duchamp was moving away from painting towards the direction of art, or to put it in other terms, um, away from medium towards concepts. As he expressed it in a later interview in 1961, the, art, uh, the word art, um, etymologically speaking, means to make, simply to make. Now, what is making? Making something is choosing a tube of blue, a tube of red, putting it on a palette. So in order to choose, you could use tubes of paint, you could use brushes, but you can also use a ready-made thing, made either mechanically or by the hand of another man, even if you want and appropriate it, since it's you who chooses it. Choice is the main thing, even in normal painting. And as de Derf has suggested, here we can understand Duchamp as claiming the concept of the ready-made as a sort of abnormal painting. In reply to Kandinsky's claim that abstract pure painting emerges straight from the virgin paint tube, Duchamp contrarily claims the paint tube itself was ready-made, again in 1962. Let's say you use a tube of paint. You didn't make it. You bought it and used it ready-made. Even if you mix two vermilions together, it's still a mixing of two ready-mades. So man can never expect to start from scratch. He must start from ready-made things like even his own mother and father. Ultimately, this leads to all painting becoming subsumed within the frame of the ready-made. Quote, since tubes of paint used by artists are manufactured and ready-made products, we must conclude that all paintings in the world are ready-made aided and also works of assemblage. Painting and ready-made thus become points on the same path. Let me illustrate this point um, about painting in the ready-made and music by reference to a small work by Duchamp. Intriguingly entitled, Avoir l'apprenti le soleil, or in translated into English, to have the apprentice in the sun. Now, titles are important to Duchamp, heightening the edges of the literary and artistic. He referred to titles as an invisible color. They're not simply adjuncts to art, they're integral parts to it. Now, this little drawing is in some ways a definition of drawing itself. It's a work about a figure on a surface. The Oxford English Dictionary defines drawing as, one, a trace, to, sorry, trace or produce a line or mark on a surface. Two, pull or move something in a specific direction. This work is a line drawing on a sheet of music paper of a cyclist moving up the slope. The words and image carefully relate around a pun, which could be translated as to see the imprint, which is the ground. An imprint is a drawing, a marking with lines. But of course, musical manuscript paper is also a ground, marked with five lines, upon which musical space is then inscribed. 
But in this work, musical space has been rendered by Duchamp as pictorial space through the addition of drawing rather than the addition of musical notation. The cyclist now ascends as if up a musical incline or scale. This is an ascent from the ground to the sun, as the punning title has it. From sol, ground, or soil in French, to soleil, French for sun. And sol, of course, is the fifth degree of the tonic sol fa scale, which is a system of attributing distinct syllables to each note of the musical scale. The incline the cyclist mounts is like an unfurled musical clef that might also suggest pictorial recession and thus creates an even more ambiguous ground-to-figure relationship. The space of music, whereby ascent equals height equals a rise in pitch, is here conflated with an illusionistic rising up the page. This is a work in which music forms the ground from which an illusion emerges, struggling uphill from the ab abstract ground of music to the illusion of the figure. Ironically, if we take the musical stave to be in the treble, then the ascent, despite the obvious effort, is only up a fifth from B to F. In other words, from a tonic to the fifth, from the tonic to sol, or from home to the sun. This little drawing could be seen as an analogue for the struggle from figuration to abstraction that Kandinsky judged to be based on a musical example. You'll remember the quote, an artist who sees that the imitation of natural appearances, however artistic is not for him, sees with envy how naturally and easily such goals are attained in music. The key difference is that for Duchamp, the point of departure is from what is given, the ready-made, which, in the case of music, is the very paper on which it's written. Unlike the purist modernists, for whom music's abstracted sound, its non-materiality, was the paradigm, for Duchamp, it was the opposite, its materiality, its notation. The ideology of music as sound alone does not interest Duchamp. He was too much of an artist for that. He starts by playing with materials, doodling on music paper, and from that, the cyclist rises up. Music's abstract space becomes fictive space. He effectively reverses Kandinsky's journey, and his cyclist ascends to image, even as his famous nude descended towards abstraction. As Kandinsky strives towards a new object for art, to replace natural appearance, to replace the missing object, to aspire to the condition of music, Duchamp answers with the found object, the ready-made, and his first real ready-made, promise the possibility of sound, unlike Kandinsky's silent painted spaces. Duchamp's first ready-made was another bicycle, the Bicycle Wheel of 1913. Bicycle Wheel has been described as the first example of kinetic art, but it's also linked to the condition of music, I would suggest. In 1766, Gothold Lessing separated art from music along spatial and temporal lines. But Duchamp's first ready-made is contrived to pass the time. He found it, in his own words, I quote, very soothing, very comforting, a sort of opening of avenues onto other things than the material life of every day. I enjoyed looking at it, just as I enjoyed looking at the flames dancing in the fireplace. It has the attraction of something moving in the room while you're thinking about something else. It moves, but it might also sound not just the friction of movement, the squeak of the wheel, but also the almost irresistible temptation to stick a brush, pencil, or pen, or stick against the spokes. It's not just a kinetic sculpture, it's a sonoric sculpture that sounds or may not. When I was um, younger, about the same age as the character on the screen, I used to ride my bicycle with a lolly stick. Um, stuck through so that it would make tinging sounds on the spokes. I cannot believe that Duchamp didn't sit in his studio and put a brush against those spokes when it was spinning round. For Duchamp, the bicycle wheel is an instrument, perhaps a musical one, but certainly one that allowed him to play and which resulted in something more than just the visual. And this is an idea developed by the contemporary French artist Cécile Tripp in her homage to both Cage and Duchamp 
in her music for prepared bicycles of 1912. What she's done is to add guitar strings to the spokes of the wheel. So she's taken some of the spokes out and put guitar strings in them, and it was first performed in Mumbai. In one of his last interviews, he said, I always kept busy in a mental way. He was asked, was that mental activity art? He replied that, after a certain point, I lost interest in making objects or pictures for sale. If you take away commerce and the prattle of critics, present company accepted, he was always very diplomatic, there is something left which may be art or something else. Then asked if that something else was an idea, he said, no, not an idea, a rumor, a perfume. So in the interests of keeping busy in a mental way, and to return to my question, why are there several arts and not just one? One answer might be, art is not just an idea, it's also a rumor a fragrance, a, si a sound, a sight, and perhaps simply a word, but it is several things in one. Thank you very much. <laughs>